Right, class, time to begin. I don't have any real announcements uh, or reminders today. Uh, in a perfect world, homework five would be available uh, today, but uh, we're still kind of fine tuning things. Uh, it's going to be entirely on Canvas. Uh, it'll be one of these quizzes that you get a couple of options for. Um, and But I'm hoping that I can do things with it that maybe Canvas, Canvas doesn't seem to allow. And I'm trying to basically figure out how to get it done. Uh, but anyway, so it, it will be uh, hopefully available later tonight or more likely early tomorrow morning and you get a week for it. Um, any other logistical things to discuss? Yes. Six. Yeah. The sixth one will be pretty implementation heavy. Uh, you might end up implementing uh, SVM depending on what we how, where we get maybe logistic regression and possibly deriving some back propagation type thing, but we'll see. No, it won't. It won't. Yeah. Yes. Sorry? No, assignment five does not have a coding portion. It's uh, it's like your assignment three, I think. Uh, meaning it won't be multiple choice questions, but fully on canvas. And you get a couple of uh, uh, attempts at it. Other questions? Oh, uh, there's a question on when the midterm grades will be out. We are almost done grading. Right now, we are at like 80 plus percent, 88. We are 88 percent done grading. So the 12 percent is taking longer than uh, it should. But um, my hope is that the midterm grades will be available by. Uh, the weekend or something like that. There's still some, uh, you know, we need to do the, finish the grading and then do a pass to make sure that uh, uh, everything is uh, uniformly done. So um, hopefully it'll be, you'll have your grades by this weekend or Monday or something like that, or at least the scores. Yes. No, so for the midterm, we will uh, normalize the scores and then put the curves. Uh, the scores on canvas we're using grade scope for grading so you'll be able to uh, have people seen used grade scope before most of you so we'll be uh, you'll be able to uh, do regrade requests and all that in grade scope other questions or comments or things like that no okay so we're going to go back into uh, uh, where we were at the end of the last lecture, we were talking about support vector machines. And what we had seen in the last lecture was uh, a sequence of uh, sort of uh, arguments. The first one was that if we have low VK dimension, then our model generalized better. This is not something we saw in the last semester, last lecture, but it was before. Lower VK dimension leads to better generalizing. And then we saw this theorem from Wapnick that said uh, for linear classifiers, the VC dimension um, shrinks if the margin grows bigger. So this means that there's a natural strategy for learning for better generalization, namely uh, train models that uh, maximize the margin because that leads to lower VC dimension, that leads to better generalization. So this was the idea that we wanted to operationalize. Then we started setting up this uh, uh, op optimization objective for support vector machines. And in particular, in the last lecture, we looked at the situation where our data set is linearly separable. Um, our goal is among all the linear classifiers that separate the data, find the one that has the maximum margin. That's the, uh, that's the optimization goal for, uh, that for certain technical reasons gives us something called a support vector machine. And through a rather uh, intricate set of arguments that I won't repeat unless there's a question, from here, we went to this idea that in order to maximize the margin, what we need to do is minimize over all the parameters, the norm of the weights or the squared norm of the weights that I can write that as uh, w transpose w, I put a half there because uh, we're going to take 
derivatives later such that for every example i'm going to say for all i or let's say for all x comma y in the data we have y w transpose x is greater than or equal to 1 in other words what we are saying is we want to maximize the margin uh, or find the weight that uh, uh, that increase the norm of the uh, uh, the weight as much as possible such that for the examples that actually lie on the margin it's uh, that the examples that are closest to the the separator its functional margin which is simply this quantity y w transpose x is equal to 1 for all other examples that quantity is more than 1 so for all examples in general y w transpose x is at least 1 so we set up an optimization problem uh, going ahead what i will do is uh, argue that um, the, the, uh, make an argument of something like that the, of this kind um, our goal is to minimize the norm of the weights doing so will give us the maximum of one over the norm that basically is like a margin such that for all examples x i y i y w transpose x is uh, more than one and this condition has to be true for every example in the training set in particular the example that's closest to the separator at which point you the inequality becomes an equality so y w transpose x will be equal to one this uh, optimization problem gives us something called the hard support vector machine hard because it assumes hard separability um, and i'm not going to talk about solving this optimization problem yet uh, rather i'd like to uh, think about the question of uh, what happens if your data is not separable but before that questions about uh, what we saw in, in the last lecture if there are no questions we're going to charge on so the uh, the a natural next thing is what happens if your data is not separable uh, what you would like to do is if the hard SPM says maximize the margin such that every example has a functional margin. Functional margin is simply this quantity here. Every example has a functional margin of at least one. Now, can someone tell me what happens if your data is not separable? If your data is not linearly separable, and I set up this optimization problem and I give it to a solver. What would any reason? What should any reasonable solver do? There's a question on uh, uh, on um, on on Zoom. Is there data? If there is data that has only one classifier, is there a margin, or is margin infinity in that case? So there is hardly. I, I can't think of a situation where the data set has exactly one classifier because. Assuming that all your data points are unique, there will be an infinite gap between any two points that are, uh, uh, you know, of different labels because we are talking about the real numbers. So there's all the margin will be really, really okay. Uh, the sorry, the turns out the question was not one classifier, one classifier, but one label. So if the data has only one label, can we still build a classifier? If if the data has only one label, then what we can, we can kind of massage things a bit, but uh, essentially we could say that there is this collection of examples that all have one label. There is this other collection of examples that has the other label, but those points are at infinity. So we can put the classifier anywhere we want. So the margin becomes infinity. Let's go back to this uh, um, question that's on the slide. What happens to this hard SVM optimization problem if the data is not separable? So the one answer that's being proposed is that the optimization problem will not give us any answer. Yeah, so 
That's right. So let me repeat that and uh, maybe draw an example here. Let's say you have a data set that looks like and minus. This data is clearly not linearly separable, right? Now, I'm going to try to find a weight vector that perfectly classifies this data. What does it mean for the, a data set to be linearly separable? For all examples, remember, we encountered this uh, even with perceptron uh, in the mistake bound proof. For all examples, we say that the data is linearly separable if there exists some weight, let's call that u, such that u is a vector, such that for every example, u transpose x times y is greater than or equal to 0. Oh, no, strictly greater than 0. It's, in fact, it's greater than or equal to some margin gamma. So this is the, you can think of this as like a definition of linear separability. There is some number gamma such that uh, uh, there's some weight vector that uh, separates the data. Now, instead of using gamma, we can just divide both sides by gamma. So you get greater than or equal to one, where the this quant this thing here, u divided by gamma becomes like a weight factor. So there is some weight factor such that y times that weight dot every example, uh, uh, or the label times the weight dot the example is at least one. If that property is not satisfied, the data set is not linearly separable. This is almost like a definition of linear separability. So what we are asking for from this optimization problem is find the uh, a vector w that has the minimum value of w transpose w. Now, which weight vectors is this optimization problem allowed to search over? You can always think of any optimization problem as a search problem. Minimize the weight such that this constraint holds. What does it mean to say that the constraint holds? I only will I will only consider those sets of weights where that rule is satisfied for all i. Well, if your data is not linearly separable, this condition does not hold. There is no weight factor that satisfies that rule, that uh, condition for all the examples. So what we are really saying is minimize the weights, uh, sorry, the norm of the weights or the squared norm of the weights such that the weight vector is in the empty set. Because not even one vector satisfies all the constraints. That means we are searching over the empty set and asking us to find asking to find the best weight vector in the empty set. This is a ill-defined problem because there is no weight vector in that empty set. How can we find the minimum? This means that any respectable optimizer will take this optimization problem for a data set like uh, the one that's kind of disappeared now that looks like this. And basically, throw an exception. You're asking me to find a weight vector that has the lowest norm among all weight vectors that are inside this empty set. Does not compute. So the hard SVM does not work for data that is not linearly separable. Before we talk about how to fix this, any thoughts about this intuition? What we have here is an infeasible set of constraints. There is, no, there is no possible solution as a result, no optimizer can work. Yes? Do you have a question? That's what we're gonna do next. But before we talk about what how to solve the problem, is the problem does the problem make sense? In fact, another thing that uh, we have as a side effect, it turns out, is we have a test for linear separability. If somebody gives you a data set and you asks you, I need to know if this data set is linearly separable, you set up the hard SVM optimization problem, and if that opti if an optimizer throws an exception and assuming there are no bugs then the data is not linearly separable. This is a test for linear separability. In fact, we don't even need this. We can 
we don't even need that objective. We can put anything in the objective because we're going, we going to set up an infeasible set of constraints. And if the, if the optimizer says it's infeasible, then we know that the data is not linearly separable. Okay, so now we're going to uh, see what how we can. Uh, okay, so the, this is just a summary of what we saw. The constraint optimization problem. There is no, if the data is not separable, there is no set of weights that will satisfy all the constraints. In other words, that will classify the data correctly. As a result, we have an infeasible solution and infeasible optimization problem that does not have any solution. The intuition for what, how we can fix that is to allow some examples to break into the margin. To allow some examples to violate the margin condition. So here's a data set that is not linearly separable, but also kind of weird because there's this plus that's somewhere in the middle that's out of place. And there's this minus here that's clearly in the wrong, uh, wrong side of things. So imagine that those two points did not exist. If those two points did not exist, the data is linearly separable. So could we set up an optimization problem where the optimizer is allowed to uh, ignore some data points or in some sense cut some slack by saying, let's not worry about those points. No, if you just do that, what might end up happening is that the optimizer will get uh, very happy and say, let's not worry about any of the points. Let me ignore all the examples and give you any weight vector because if I ignore all the points, any weight vector is good. So we can't let it ignore all the data points. So we need to add some penalty. We need to ask it to pay a price for every point that it ignores. So the optimization problem becomes a little bit more tricky. Right? So we are allowing it to ignore points, but at the same time, asking it to pay something in case it chooses to ignore points. And hopefully by doing that, it will not ignore too many things and only uh, ignore the points that are that are really on the wrong side of the market. So if you have points that are, if you ignore these two points, then we can set up an, the, without those circle points, we might set up, uh, be, be able to find a weight vector that has a pretty large margin, right? Because these two do not exist anymore. So then what you might end, what might end up happening is that without, with, with this new larger margin, the data set might generalize better. So the, the classifier might generalize better. That's the hope. Uh, questions about this. So when we are, by the way, when we are computing the margin for this new uh, situation, we are going to be, we need to learn to ignore all the data points that, are, that the optimizer is, asked, is uh, ignoring as well. This intuition is going to uh, allow us to construct something that I'm just for the sake of this, uh, these few slides, I'm calling the soft SVM just as a contrast to hard SVM. In practice, it's not really called soft SVM, it's just called SVM. So we have this original hard SVM that says, maximize the margin by minimizing the norm of the weights, such that for every example, YW transpose X is at least one. In other words, every example has a functional margin of at least one. This is the hard SVM problem. What we will do is for every example, we will allow something, we'll introduce something called a slack variable. The slack variable is this Greek letter psi. And despite having taught this lecture many, many times, I still haven't figured out how to write the letter correctly. So when I actually write it, you will see me do this. Um, so, which it's just a squiggle as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so we'll introduce one slack variable for each example. The slack variable is just a positive number. And instead of asking for YW transpose X to be more than one, we are going to ask for YW transpose X to be more than one minus the slack. So imagine that the slack variable is a positive number. If I say that, uh, if let's say, xi i, so this is the Greek letter that's written xi. So xi i is, let's say, um, 100. 
then what you're saying is y w transpose x should be more than negative 99. So if is 100, then what we want because it's one minus psi i. But y w transpose x is if it is positive, that means the data set that example is correctly classified. Only if it's greater than zero. If it's negative, then that means it's a mistake. So what we are allowing is that the class we are allowing the weight vector to make a mistake on this example uh, by allowing it to be negative. Anything between minus one, sorry, anything between zero and negative ninety-nine is a mistake, but we are still allowing it. Different examples can have different slack. So we are going to introduce one slack variable for each example. The intuition here is that slack variables allow examples to quote unquote break into the margin. If the slack is zero, then um, we are back in this situation here. If psi i is zero, then we are y w transpose x should be more than one. That means that example has to be classified not just correctly, but away from the margin. Because equal to one means on the margin, uh, more than one means away from the margin. So if slack is zero, then the example is on the right side of the uh, hyperplane. If slack is negative, that means it's allowed to kind of go closer to the hyperplane. Any questions about the intuition? Because the next slide is going to be just a whole bunch of equations. Yes. It's somewhat similar to so, in fact, there is an interesting connection to the margin perceptron in that uh, we are maximized, we are, we are introducing this margin between the positive and the negative examples, but uh, we are allowing that margin value to be decided automatically. So, there it would be some margin average. Well, no, there it's a hyperparameter. You just pick a hyperparameter. There's a question on Slack. Is it possible for an adversary to construct a data set so that the soft exam, soft SVM will allow too many examples to break into the margin? Absolutely, yes. In fact, uh, that would be a fun exercise to think about. How would you construct a data set after we go through this whole thing? Think about how to construct a data set such that the soft SVM or just SVM will ignore all data points. Um, it turns out that uh, you can do that, but there's going to be another knob that we control that controls how much we are allowing this sort of breaking into the margin. And we'll get to this a uh, uh, little while, uh, in, a, in a little while. Other questions or uh, any thoughts about it? Just the intuition. So um, since I just have equations here, let me also draw a picture. Let's say you have a data set that looks like this. There are these three examples on each side, so six examples in total are nicely separable. And then there's this one outlier that's somewhere here. And then there's another outlier that's somewhere here. Now, if, let me draw a few hyperplanes. I can draw, a, if, I, if I draw, uh, let's say if I draw a hyperplane right here, let me actually put the other example right. So if I draw this blue line and say, uh, uh, and consider what it's doing, it's the margin for that blue line would be uh, decided by these, something like that. Um, let me, so the margin for that would be decided. So that means that this example, uh, has gone to the wrong side of the margin entirely. And this example has also gone to the wrong side, but it's not terrible. It's not all the way on, on the other side of the margin. It's just crossed the hyperplane. That is one possibility. Both those examples will have a value of psi that is positive. All the other examples will have a value of psi that is uh, zero. Now, instead of that hyperplane, I could also consider a different one which I'm going to draw in black. Actually, you know, let me draw the picture again. So you have three pluses, three minuses, a plus here and a minus here. 
another alternative weight vector I could consider is this hyperplane whose margin is just this. And now for this one, the new one at the bottom, only one example breaks into the margin, this thing here. So it has a very large value of psi, but notice that the resulting margin is tiny. Now the model has to figure out, should I allow two examples to break into the, uh, the margin or can I, should I allow the resulting hyperplane to have a very low margin? This is in some sense a trade-off that it needs to make. So now let's uh, see how this gets uh, uh, instantiated. I promised you a lot of equations and uh, uh, I hope I didn't disappoint. So we, we, we need to set up a new optimization problem for learning. Um, let's kind of uh, stare at this and look at that. This is almost like, you know, compare and contrast these two things. One difference is in the hard SVM, we demanded that for every example, y w transpose x should be more than one, should have a functional margin of at least one. The soft SVM, we are saying, it's okay. Uh, I don't need the functional margin to be more than one. I need it to be one minus the slack for each example. Every example has its own slack variable. Another difference is, of course, the by definition, the slack variables are going to be positive. So we have this thing here, for all examples, the slack variable has to be positive. We never had that in the first one. A third difference here is in the original case, we were minimizing only the norm, only the weights. Now our optimization problem has to decide both the weight and the slack. A final difference, probably the most consequential one here is the, opt the objective of the optimization. Originally, we were just minimizing half W transpose W. Now we have this extra term plus C times the sum of the slack. The reason for that, let's pretend that we don't worry about the C right now. The reason for adding up all the slacks and adding it to the minimization problem is to say, I don't want my optimizer to just allow all my examples to have a big slack value. So because if the slack variable is positive, that means that we are allowing that example to break into the margin. And remember, we are minimizing the sum of all the slacks. So that's the price that the mod optimizer has to pay for actually allowing the examples to break into the margin. Questions? Yes. Why do we have uh, like an individual slack variable per example instead of just one? One giant slack variable. It turns out that exists. I mean, there are many, many variants of uh, the SVM out there. There's something called the sling, single slack version where uh, we just have a single uh, slack variable. It turns out that particular single slack behaves like the minimum, did I say, like the maximum of all of these things. It behaves like the worst case. And uh, there is uh, there's some, uh, the, I distinctly remember seeing a paper which actually studies that and proves things about it. This one's actually a little bit easier to work with. Uh, it, Despite the fact that there are many, many more things to optimize, this leads to a more sort of a, a, a easy to optimize problem that we will encounter next. Yes. Why do we do like square or cube or something in the slack variable? Like, which one is that? So we can get like, well, the slack variable is way out there. Right. So there's, in fact, that variant also exists. There's an interesting variant that says the, the penalty is going to be slack squared. And by putting the penalty as slack squared, uh, if I remember right, this condition goes away. I think you need to put the square in two places. That condition goes away. And that is a version that uh, you can actually run that version inside liblinear. It's one of the command line options that you can use. It's, a, it's an SVM library that exists out there. And that also leads to interesting optimization, uh, 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 you know, interesting ways to optimize. That said though, I have personally implemented both the squared, uh, um, squ it's called the squared hinge loss and the hinge loss version of SVM. And while deriving the latter is a lot more fun in case, by fun, I mean, 
by if you count the number of whiteboards you fill up with math to derive it, derive the object, uh, the opt optimizer. It does not seem to do any better in practice on any data that I've played with. So I don't know what the value of that is. Eventually, you so there are an infinite number of variants of this. But uh, to justify using one or the other, we also need to. Oh, uh, there's a question. There's a suggestion on uh, Zoom from my TA. You're right here. You can just tell me. Uh, uh, reminding that I should repeat the questions on Zoom. Uh, let's see if I remember the questions. One question that I answered earlier was uh, why do we need one slack for each? Uh, example, can we not do with one global slack for the entire data set? And uh, the answer was that version exists. The other question is why do we need, uh, why, why are we adding up all the slack values in the objective and minimizing it? Why not the square or the cube? The answer is that also exists. Uh, and in both cases, the uh, addendum to the answer is that it's not enough that it exists. We need to show that it actually makes a difference in data. It, and often it's not clear if that choice makes any difference. Let me repeat the whole thing, but slightly differently. The what I call the soft SVM optimization problem looks something like this. We have an objective where we are minimizing all over the weights and the slacks. And the objective consists of two parts. The first part says minimize the norm of the weight. Minimizing the norm of the weight from the discussion in the last lecture is equivalent to maximizing the margin. So first, minimizing the norm of the weights tells us to that uh, we want our uh, weight vector to have as large a margin as possible. The second term says minimize the total slack. Basically, so it says allow as few examples as possible to violate this margin criteria. There's a there's this C that connects the, uh, the two of them. So it's not just minimize the uh, norm of the weights plus the total slack, it's minimize the norm of the weights plus C times the total slack. C is a hyperparameter. This hyperparameter allows us to trade off between these two terms. The first term says maximize the margin. What does maximizing the margin give us? It, it gives us better generalization through that whole VC dimension argument. So the first term is generalization. The second term says minimize the total slack. If that quantity was taken as the only thing that we need to optimize, that the, the we know that slacks are all greater than zero, right? So the minimum value, if nothing, no other constraint existed, the minimum value of a sum of numbers that can be more than zero is zero, right? You set all of them to be zero. Setting the slacks to zero is equivalent to saying I need every single training example to be perfectly classified. In other words, the second term, minimizing the total slack, controls for overfitting or leads to overfitting. C here is this knob that allows us to control how much we, do we want generalization and how much do we want overfitting. On one hand, the first term says maximize the margin, better VC dimension, better generalization. Second term says, Try to overfit all the data points. Try to explain all the data. Find a weight vector that explains all the data points. C says, how much do you care about each of these components? Uh, if C equals zero, that means we don't care. If, if C equals zero, we are back to the hard SVM case. Are we back to the hard SVM case? No. If C equals zero, what happens is it says, I don't really care about the parent, uh, you know, the slacks. Just Make the slack as big as you want. I don't really care about minimizing them. In other words, ignore all the data points. If you ignore all the data points, you get an infinite margin, which generalizes perfectly because of that VC dimension argument, infinite margin, like excellent generalization, but it has nothing to do with the data because you have essentially ignored all the data points. So if C equals zero, that's saying ignore all the data points. On the other extreme, C has to be a positive number. On the other extreme, if C becomes larger, in the worst case, infinity, if C is infinity, it says, I really don't care about the first term there. When you're minimizing this, you better make the second term here zero because otherwise your total objective is going to take an infinite value. 
So if C is infinity, that says, I really don't care about generalization. I need you to overfit the data. Of course, neither zero nor infinity are good values for C and it becomes a hyperparameter. We need to choose, this is the hyperparameter that comes into play with SVM. Questions? When C is infinity, actually, you know what? I'll come back to that point in a little while because uh, there are too many other things here that might be distracting. So I'll come back to this point. I'll, I'll repeat this entire point once again with a slightly different version of this loss, this object, this optimization. Yeah. What's the thing that you can say is the divide by C and then the by the same value? Yes, yes, yes. So that is how do you I guess it's C in this case. This C and that C are different. This C and that C are different. Yeah, but uh, you know, the old C really because you know there are some set of things yep. in my Yep. In this case, in this case, it turns out in this case, it's exactly the same points that are on the margin that define this thing. Not the ones, in, the, the, sorry, the ones that are on the margin and the ones inside. And to kind of, there's a way to prove it formally, uh, but the formal proof requires me to talk about the dual to this optimization problem. And I can send you a reference if you want, but uh, it, it gets a little hairy. Remove the points until it was the Well, no, no. Uh, that and it turns out the points that are on the wrong side also influence uh, because of a technical detail. That the, the argument that I made earlier was more an appeal to intuition. Um, more formally, the, the, there's some, there's a bit more heavy lifting that needs to be done. Let's see where we are. Once again, just Going back all the way to the beginning, what we want is better generalization. And following Wapnik, we're going to argue that uh, larger margins lead to better generalization. So we want to find models that have as large margins as possible. For the separable case, this was a relatively easier optimization problem to define. Uh, among all classifiers that separate the data, we need to find the one that has the maximum margin. Alternatively, among all weight vectors such that y, the functional margin is one or at least one, YW transpose X is at least one. We, if we find the weight vector that minimizes W transpose W, we effectively maximize the margin. Unfortunately, this only works for the case where your data is linearly separable. In the general case, to extend that, we, uh, we introduce these slack variables, one slack variable for each example. And these slack variables allow the margin constraint to be violated for that example. And uh, it kind of gives us a slightly more complicated looking optimization problem, but not, uh, uh, not something that's impossible to reason about analytically. Turns out this is basically, this optimization problem is what's called the support vector machine. Uh, I'm going to rewrite this slightly differently, but this optimization problem is the support vector machine. And notice that I still haven't told you a thing about how to solve this optimization problem. I just said, yeah, you know, we can frame this as an optimization problem and make it somebody else's uh, concern of how to actually do this minimization. And that was the state of affairs for a bit because this particular optimization problem is has a special form. The objective has a quadratic term. Like we are trying to find W and psi. The objective can be seen as a quadratic function in W and psi because W transpose W is simply, if I, if, uh, let me write this. If W is the vector W1, W2, you have D dimensions, then W transpose W is simply. It's simply the square of every term. So 
the objective has a quadratic form and the constraints are linear inequalities in the variables that we care about. This kind of an optimization problem is called a quadratic program. And there's been a cottage industry on solving quad quadratic pro uh, programs um, for decades now. So we could just take this object optimization problem, give it to those people who do these optimization and have them solve it for us, which is great. Except it turns out this particular optimization problem has some rather interesting and special structure that allows us to solve it more efficiently than the standard black box solvers for quadratic programs. And that's what we're going to uh, uh, worry about now. And using that special structure, we will then actually implement the SVM learning algorithm, a particular op which is actually one particular optimizer for the support vector machine. And it tends to be the one that's most commonly used these days because of two reasons. One, it's super easy to implement. It is so easy that it's actually going to be in your homework six. The second thing is that uh, it can be scaled up quite well for uh, to use GPUs and all that uh, cool stuff that uh, you know hardware uh, uh, engineers keep throwing at us. To get started towards that, I want you to notice. Let's examine these two constraints. The first one says y i w transpose x i is greater than or equal to one minus psi i. Let me rewrite that, and that I can just move the psi to one side and the y to the other side, the the uh, the y w transpose x to the other side, and I can say psi i is greater than or equal to one minus y i w transpose x i. I've really done nothing here. I've just uh, moved two terms. The second one is saying that psi i is greater than or equal to zero. That's this thing here. So from these two things, what do we know? We know that psi should be greater than zero and it should be greater than one minus y w transpose x. In other words, it should be greater than both of them or more correctly than the bigger of them. So we have psi i is greater than max of zero comma, right? I've done nothing very fancy here. I'm just kind of moving things around, moving uh, expressions around and uh, writing essentially equivalent expressions. So I have combined both constraints into this single constraint here. Now comes a little bit of uh, something that is a little bit of a, uh, I'm going to give a hand wavy explanation. If you want a more uh, correct one, you can talk afterward. Basically, I can replace the psi in the objective with the right hand side of this. And I have the same optimization. It turns out I have the same optimization problem because I'm essentially trying to find an upper bound of this, uh, uh, of this objective. And so if I replace this psi and take this expression, each, okay, let's not do that. Instead, let's just, write it this way. I can replace the psi here with the max of one, 0, 1 minus y w transpose x. And now I don't need any more constraints. There are no constraints because everything, all the information that was in the constraint is essentially captured here. I don't even have the slack variables in the optimization anymore uh, because I just eliminated them by, you know, uh, by substitution. So this goes out, so I'm back to an optimization problem that only involves the W. Turns out this particular expression is a lot more interpretable. What we want to do is to maximize the margin and minimize this quantity here that is that we are going to start calling the loss. The first term is simply maximizing the margin, same thing that we had before. Minimizing the norm of the weight is maximizing the margin, so we're good. The second term inside the box here says, for the ith example, if one minus y i w transpose x i is greater than zero, then this quantity inside the box becomes exactly that 
what however much is greater than zero it becomes that but what does it mean to say y i one minus y w transpose x is greater than zero that's the same as saying y i w transpose x i is less than one less than one means it's on the wrong side of the margin so if an example is on the wrong side of the margin this optimizer has to pay a penalty how much penalty exactly how much it violates the margin constraint if it's on the correct side of the margin in other words y w transpose x is if y w transpose x is greater than or equal to one then the penalty is just zero because in this box here zero wins that maximization so what we have here is on inside the box we have a penalty for this particular weight factor how much is it penalized for misclassifying this example that's the penalty that uh, you add up all the penalties and that together you would like to minimize that total penalty for misclassification plus also maximizing the margin where have we seen this idea of training a weight vector by uh, minimizing penalties of its classification before we encountered that in the first half of yes uh, not no we did not have we did not encounter that idea of a positron yet we will but we did not yet yeah regression um, i don't know which of you said regression did i still don't know which one did the other person have something else to say uh, no. linear regression so in linear regression we had essentially the same idea i need to find a weight vector that defines my linear regressor to find that weight vector, I'm going to define a certain penalty for giving the wrong answer. And I'm defining learning as the optimization problem of minimizing the total penalty over the data set. Here, I've defined in a very roundabout way by talking about Vafnik and margins and all that stuff. I have essentially come to a definition of a penalty for misclassification for uh, binary class files. Let's examine what's going on inside this penalty term. There are three cases. The first case is if the example is correctly classified. If the example is correctly classified and it's outside the margin, what that means is yi w transpose xi. First of all, it's correctly classified. That means this is positive, right? Y times w transpose x is positive. So we know that this is greater than zero and it's outside the margin. We are defining margin to be this distance of one. So not only is it greater than zero, it's actually greater than or equal to one. If it's greater than or equal to one, that means one minus y i w transpose x i is less than or equal to zero, which means the minimum, sorry, the maximum of zero and this quantity is zero. The maximum of some number that's negative and zero is of course zero. Zero is bigger than any negative number. So if the example is correctly classified and the example is placed on the correct side of the margin, then this particular weight vector pays no penalty for that example. That's case one. Case two, if the example is incorrectly classified, if the example is incorrectly classified, that means yi w transpose xi is less than zero. Right? In other words, let's make it less than or equal to zero because not a big deal. One might that in other words, minus yi w transpose xi is greater than or equal to zero. One minus yi w transpose xi is of course greater than or equal to one, but more importantly, it's also greater than zero. So the penalty here is the max of zero or this quantity. Of course, this one minus y w transpose x is more than zero, so that becomes the penalty. So if some example x i comma y i is misclassified, then by a particular weight vector, the weight vector is allowed to do that, but it has to pay a price. How much is the price? It's one minus y w transpose x. 
for that example. Remember, we are minimizing the total penalty here. So this is, we've covered two cases. Example is correctly classified and outside the margin. Example is incorrectly classified. The third case, of course, is example is correctly classified, but placed within the margin. So to kind of give you uh, pictorial examples of these three cases, if this is your weight vector and these are your, this, these two lines define the margin, case one might be, an, let's say this is the positive side. Case one might be a positive example that's here. This is one. Case two might be a positive example here. It's not only incorrectly classified, it's outside the margin. Well, no, no sorry. It's the, uh, the first case is not only correctly classified, but outside the margin. Second case is inside the margin. Don't care whether it's correct or not. In the first case, the penalty is zero. In the second case, the penalty is this distance here. And in the third case, the example is correctly classified, but within the margin. So you might have, so this is two, something like that. It's correctly classified. It's on the correct side of the hyperplane, but it's within this margin of safety that we demand. In that case, the penalty is simply the gap from here to here. Why? Because let's uh, consider that third case alone. We have yi w transpose xi is greater than zero, but it's less than one, which means one minus yi w transpose xi is greater than or equal to zero. The penalty that this particular example forces the class classifier to pay is the maximum of zero and this quantity here which is of course one minus y w transpose x. Questions? Yes. The penalty for the last two cases is mathematically the same, but uh, it has two different interpretations. Because in the second case, uh, importantly, the second case would not be treated as an error by a perceptron algorithm. The perceptron would say, yeah, it's on the correct side of the hyperplane. I don't need to make any change to this uh, hyperplane because it's fine. As PM says, it's correct, but it's still too close. So I uh, still need to pay a price. So there's a sort of a, a conceptual difference between them. Yes? No, turns out the perceptron loss is something slightly different. Um, there are two differences, in fact, uh, from this. We'll see that very soon. What we have here is actually uh, just like for regression, we had this squared loss that allowed us to define this regressor. What the SVM define something called the hinge loss function. The hinge loss is a function that takes a labeled example, x, y, and a weight vector, w, and it defines what is the penalty that the weight vector should pay on that particular labeled example. And it's exactly the thing inside the box. It's max of 0, 1 minus y, w transpose x. And the hinge loss has this nice interpretation. If you didn't like the version of the interpretation that I just showed you now, and that I worked through now, I can show you a pictorial version. The hinge loss looks something like this. So remember, the hinge loss is max of one of for one example is zero comma one minus y w transpose x. So on this axis, I have y w transpose x. On the vertical axis, I have the value of the loss. So there are a few different things happening here. In fact, in addition to the hinge loss, I've also plotted something called the zero one loss. So let's kind of uh, step through this one step, one, one thing at a time. The zero one loss is something like an accuracy. Actually, it's an error. Yes. The zero one loss says if y w transpose x is positive, then you, the, the classifier is correct. If it's negative, then the classifier is wrong. So it's literally just a threshold at zero. On this side, zero loss. On this side, loss equals one. 
it's literally saying if y w y and w transpose x have the same sign, then there is no penalty to pay. And if y and w transpose x have different signs, then for that example, the penalty is exactly one. Zero one loss is really what we want to optimize. Because you know, when we measure error of a classifier, we are literally counting how many times is the loss equal to one. How many times is y and w transpose x uh, do they have different signs? Unfortunately, the zero one loss has this, even though that's the thing that we really want to optimize, that's what we want to, that's how we evaluate our classifier. Unfortunately, it has this really awful property in that it, it there's a sudden jump at zero from here to here. It is not a continuous function, let alone differentiable. So we cannot really solve this solve an optimization problem uh, uh, in a computationally convenient way. So minimizing the zero one loss, even though it is the desirable thing to do, is not something that is computationally feasible. Instead, we set up something called a surrogate loss. A surrogate loss is our relaxation of the zero one loss. This is another way to think about the hinge loss. The hinge loss is a surrogate for the zero one loss that we are actually want to optimize. What the hinge loss says is uh, there are three regimes. On this side of y w transpose x, if it is more than one, there's no penalty. So for if the example is far away from one for positive examples or minus one for negative examples, uh, then there's no penalty to pay for that weight vector. Then there is this region here where the zero one loss is one, which means there was an error on that side. The penalty keeps growing as the error uh, gets worse and worse. As the example keeps getting placed on the wrong side of the margin, farther and farther away, the price being paid is more and more because uh, it increases uh, as y w transpose x decreases. In between, in this region, there's something interesting happening. The zero one loss says that region, the, the example is correctly classified. But the hinge loss says, it's fine if it's correctly classified, I don't care. I need to actually push that example farther away. So if you really want to put an example here, you need to pay a penalty. How much? Whatever is uh, the value of one minus y w transpose x. Why do you want to push that example away? Because that kind of makes uh, the, that makes them, uh, the, that introduces this gap between the positive and the negative example. So there's like, it leads to better generalization. Questions? Nope, turns out no, not even that is the perceptron. Um, we'll get there, we'll, in fact, we won't get there, but we won't, we won't get there right now. We'll get there uh, after a little while. I'll tell you the answer though. The perceptron loss, I'm going to draw that in blue, looks something like this. It, there's no penalty if you're, if the example is correctly classified. If the example is incorrectly classified, the penalty grows like this. I will not talk about why right now. When we complete the unit on uh, stochastic gradient descent for SVM, I will let you figure it out on your own. Turns out the perceptron algorithm, the batch perceptron algorithm is another way to introduce it would have been to say that it's a stochastic gradient descent algorithm for uh, the perceptron loss. Yes. No, because there was also there is still the regularizer. There's the regularizer term that the person that remember the object, the objective here has this other term. Then so that, that also comes into play. Uh, oh, sorry, the question. What was the question? The question was, if we put a margin of one with perceptron, do we get back SVM? The answer is, well, there's still the regularizer that makes that that that's uh, that needs to be accounted for. Okay, now uh, just to revisit this, we have, we want to maximize the margin and minimize the loss. And the SVM uh, um, uh, optimization problem has these two terms. The first term explicitly kind of maximizes the margin. The second term 
uh, sets up a penalty for mixed misclassification, and we can consider these three cases. But notice that what is going on here? The first term says better generalization. The second term says overfit. Because if I if I minimize the second term aggressively, that one that's just saying uh, I, I need every example to have a zero loss. So every example will be placed far away from the margin. Every example is correctly classified. So the second term alone pushes for overfitting. The first term alone pushes for generalization. And the SVM can be seen as this trade-off between these two aspects uh, controlled by this knob uh, C, a positive number. This is actually a much more general principle than just SVM. This is an idea called risk minimization. Risk minimization is perhaps the standard dominant paradigm for machine learning today, where what we do is we define the notion of loss over the training data for a particular hypothesis class. So for regression, we define the squared loss. For SVM, we define the hinge loss. In both cases, it turns out that the hypothesis was a linear function. One of them was classifier, one of them was a regressor. But for other classifiers also, we could define a loss function. And then we define learning as simply the optimization problem of finding the hypothesis that has the lowest loss on the training data. That's great. Until we start thinking about overfitting. Simply finding the lowest loss on the data is going to give us grief because we might end up overfitting. We might end up overfitting the training data. Instead, we now get to the full version of risk minimization, which is called regularized risk minimization. We define two functions. One function is the same thing that we saw before, the loss. The loss says how much should this example this, para, this classifier we penalize for making mistakes on the training data. And we want to minimize that quantity. The other function is called a regularizer. The regularizer is not a penalty for misclassifying, but in fact, it's a penalty for complexity, for constructing classifiers that are over complex. And so, minimize, so minimizing the regularizer alone leads to better generalization. You can think of it as capacity control, making the models more uh, less expressive. And the goal of learning is not just to minimize the loss or the regularizer, but finding the a, a sweet spot between them. The goal of learning is to find a hypothesis that has the lowest sum of the loss plus the regularizer typically controlled by a hyperparameter that says how much do we care about each of these things. So I want to instantiate this idea for SVM. We have these two terms. The first term is the regularizer. The regularization term maxi uh, prefers maximizing the margin and it improves, it, it essentially uh, introduces this preference for hypotheses that are um, have larger margin, as a result, uh, it can lead to better generalization due to that theorem from Proplick. This is just one regularizer, and the way I introduced it, it seems like this is the natural thing to do. Turns out there are other regularizers also that are studied in the literature. This is just called the L2 regularizer, L2, because it's the, it's the Euclidean distance of, or the, Euclidean, the L2 norm of the weight vector. The other term here is called the empirical loss. It's the penalty on the training set. It penalizes weight vectors for making mistakes on your data. In general, it penalizes hypotheses for making mistakes on the training data. We have looked at one particular um, uh, empirical loss here, namely the hinge loss. And so that also can be replaced with other loss functions, and they are typically replaced with other losses in the data. One loss function that tends to be uh, sort of popular with the neural network community for some reasons is something called the cross entropy loss. We'll be looking at a sort of a baby version of the cross entropy loss uh, when we come to logistic regression. Turns out they are the same thing. Uh, 
and there are other losses also. In fact, we've already seen, but not actually seen uh, formally, the perceptron loss. So you can have different empirical losses here also. We've seen a couple of them. And then there's this hyperparameter that controls a trade-off between larger margin versus better uh, loss. And how do you know how to what value that hyperparameter should take? How do you find the value of any hyperparameter when you're running experiments? That was not a rhetorical question. Cross-validation. So you set up this massive cross-validation infrastructure that uh, tries out different values of C. In practice, it turns out that uh, for SVM, uh, you just need to go in orders of magnitude. So you can do 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0 0.001, and so on. And that's the level of uh, granularity that seems to matter. Questions about the SVM objective function or this principle of risk minimization or regularized risk minimization? Yes. Is there uh, is there any particular reason why we need like a C instead of like some other variable and then one minus that variable? Oh, you could do that also. So the question is, uh, I'm going to write a word. So the question was, why did I use C and not a slightly different version? So let me write a different version here and I'll tell you why those two are equivalent. So what I just wrote here is minimize or wait. I'm not going to write the whole thing. Regularizer of the weight plus C times. That's what I wrote here. The alternative version and the thing that's uh, uh, in this situation, C is a hyperparameter that's greater than zero. Another version could be minimize I could have done this. In this case, C is a number between zero and one. In fact, let's not allow it to be exactly equal anyway, because I don't want either of these things to be negative. A third case could be something like this. Where both lambda one and lambda two are positive numbers. I could have done any of these things. It turns out they are all equivalent. Why? Let me just uh, work with the second case and the same argument will hold for others also. In the second case, instead of doing this, I could have, you know what, let me not put C here, okay? Let me put lambda, okay? So what I could have done is multiplied, divided throughout by one minus lambda. So I divide by one minus. And then multiply by one minus lambda, but it's a constant, so it becomes one minus lambda here. But that constant doesn't really matter for my optimization, so I can get rid of it. This becomes one. Now this, this is independent of the W, so I can ignore it. And the thing inside the box, I'm now going to call it C. So I'm back to one. I could do the same thing for the third case also. So they are all essentially equivalent. Uh, the reason I choose this thing is primarily historical. When I first came across this idea in the first version of SVM that I implemented, uh, I kind of followed the notation that was done in the liblinear uh, package. And there they have that. Um, there are certain versions where people just have a single hyperparameter and it's attached to the regularizer. Basically the same thing, doesn't really matter. There's a question on Zoom. Are there equivalent regularized risk minimization formulations for the other learning algorithms we've seen in the semester, or is it something to something specific to SVM and other algorithms? So it there is, it turns out that SVM is a regularized risk minimizer. You can think of perceptron as an unregularized but still risk minimizer. Um, I'm not going to prove it, but there's a very neat way to show that. Add a boost is actually minimizing a certain loss function also called the exponential loss. Logistic regression, which we will see much later, is also minimizing a, a loss function called the logistic loss. So a whole bunch of learning algorithms that we encounter are essentially risk minimizers. The one outlier, it turns out, is actually the ID3 algorithm. 
the first learning algorithm we saw was actually does not really fit neatly into this frame. Pretty much everything else can be forced into this uh, this worldview. Other questions? Yes. Why did I start? So the question is, why did I start instead of saying W transpose W, why am I saying the regularizer of W? The answer is, uh, this is just one particular regularizer. There are other regularizers in the literature. This is the squared norm, uh, so the L2 regularizer. But it turns out you could also do uh, use something called the L1 regularizer, which is L1 norm. And this argument is independent of all that. What, why is it called a regularizer? The reason it's called a regularizer is uh, uh, at this point, I'm kind of uh, making a conjecture about the etymology of the word. Um, it is introducing a sort of a smoothness into the loss landscape. You can think of the, the objective that you are minimizing as this landscape that we are trying to find the minimum of. The regularizer, quote unquote, regularizes it. It makes it a little smoother, thereby making the optimization a little easier. Uh, that's my guess for the name, but uh, maybe someone else will find out that uh, there's a mistake and you can tell me about it. There's a qu another question. Uh, is it beneficial for the loss function, which is this term here, to be differentiable so that we can use uh, uh, gradient descent to minimize loss. This expression that's on the screen is not differentiable. How would you even minimize something like the hinge loss? That's a fantastic question. In fact, that's such a good question that I have an entire lecture around it uh, on how do you train SVMs with gradient-based optimization? So we have maybe six or seven minutes left. Uh, so I'm going to now quickly introduce the big high level idea of what we want to do. And then we'll get into the details of this question uh, in the next lecture. So we've already talked about how to train by maximizing the margin. The answer is we set up an optimization problem. What optimization problem? Well, the SVM objective, and that gives us an unconstrained optimization problem that uh, we can uh, give to any solver, but giving it to any solver, it turns out does not exploit the intrinsic structure that's in the problem that we want to optimize. So we can do better than a black box solver. And that's what we're going to do next. We're going to talk about how to solve the SVM optimization problem. We have this objective function, just to remind you, our goal is given a data set to search over all possible weight vectors and find the one that has the minimum value uh, of this sum here. This unit is going to be a little uh, detailed. First, I'm going to talk about convex functions and gradient descent. We've already seen gradient descent, so I don't need to get into too much detail around that. Then I'll talk about stochastic gradient descent. Turns out we've already seen that, but I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that uh, and talk about the difference between these two things. None of those ideas apply to SVM because as the question points out, this objective has a max, the function that is not smooth. It looks like this. So it's not a function that is uh, differentiable because there is this point at zero, which is uh, where it's not differentiable. So we have to, in some sense, look at this generalization of the concept of gradient or of derivatives uh, to talk about something called subderivatives. In particular, the hinge loss does not have a derivative, but it has a subderivative. And we will not be talking about stochastic gradient descent, but we'll be talking about stochastic subgradient descent. We'll talk about all of that later. And once we get to the stochastic, uh, once we get to subderivatives and kind of get a grasp of what that is, we can put it into the standard SGD algorithm that we had to get the stochastic subgradient descent algorithm for SVM. At the end of all of that, you will, we will end up with an algorithm 
that will look eerily like the perceptron algorithm. It's essentially the same as the batch perceptron that we saw so long back, except for, I think, maybe one or two lines of code. If you count in characters, it might actually be about 12 characters difference between SVM and perceptron. So at that point, you might say, did we really have to go through all this? Or you might say, oh, that's so cool. I think it's cool. So let's uh, quickly just go over uh, convex functions and gradient descent. Uh, our goal is to solve this optimization problem. Turns out this function here, this is just, you know, you can think of this as uh, some function of W, right? I mean, given a data set, this is just a function of W. Turns out this function is convex in W. How many people have encountered this concept of convexity before? Some subset of you. Um, a convex function, I say recall, but if you've not encountered it, uh, here's an introduction. Here's like a crash course on convexity. Suppose you have a function f. I'm going to call that function convex. If for any u and v that are in the domain of the function, and for any lambda that is between 0 and 1 inclusive, we have this property here. f of lambda u plus 1 minus lambda v is less than or equal to lambda times f of u plus 1 minus lambda times f of v. Just looking at that may not feel particularly inspiring. So let's uh, kind of look at what this uh, translates to in pictures. So I have this function here, f, and the horizontal axis is the domain of that function. For any u, I can I can uh, I can compute the value of f of u. For any v, I can compute the value of f of v. And in fact, I can draw the line between them to get this uh, what's called a secant line. This is a secant. Nothing here should be shocking. I've done. I've just drawn a line between two points. Now, let's pick any value of lambda. The value of lambda between uh, uh, zero and one. Uh, allows us to interpolate u and v uh, in this way. So this much u and this much v together gives you these points, this point here. So we have a point that is lambda times u plus one minus lambda times v. For that particular point, we can ask what value does the function take? It's a point in the domain, right? So I can ask what value does the function take? Well, it's this value here. So that is f of lambda u plus 1 minus lambda v. In addition, I can also ask for that particular interpolant, interpolated point, how, where does the, where do we land on that secant line? That's exactly the value of that, that interpolate f of u and f of v in these, mixes these two things in the same proportion. Lambda times f of u plus 1 minus lambda times f of v. So we have mixed either the u and v in the proportion of lambda and one minus lambda, or we have mixed the value of the function in this proportion, lambda and one minus lambda. Turns out this function is called convex if for any value of u and v and for any value of lambda, the secant, any point on the secant lies above the function itself. Yes. So the question was, can can we say that a convex function forms a convex hull in the uh, uh, whose graph forms a convex hull? Basically, yes. Yes. Another way of saying this is, it's a function that looks like a cup. You know this. The cup here. Um, that's the loosest way of saying it. But yeah, another way of saying that is uh, any secant line lies above the function itself. Like this, that is called a concave function. Any secant line lies below the function itself, and that's exactly the opposite. This inequality becomes greater than equal. To. 
Yeah, the, you're right. Not all functions found. You're right. The, what I said earlier was not true. Yeah. yeah. So also complex functions always have a global minimum. Convex functions have a global minimum, and that's the property that we are after. That's the reason why I'm going through all of this anyway. From a geometric perspective, this becomes important when we come to subgradients. From a geometric function perspective, I can define a convex function as one where every tangent plane lies below the function. Um, we are out of time, so I'll just stop with this last slide. We, it's easy to come up with convex functions. Linear functions are convex. The square is convex. Importantly, for, from our point of view, max of two things is a convex function. And there are many different ways of showing how a function is convex. So you can use the definition. You can kind of, there's something called the second derivative test, which is uh, 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 you take the second derivative of the function and you show that the resulting matrix is positive semi-definite. Not all functions are convex. You have concave functions where the inequality is reversed. And then there are functions that are neither convex nor concave. The only reason we are worried about a convex function is what you just said. For convex functions, if the gr gradient of that function is zero, then we know that we are at a point of minimum. And that's what we are going to use next. All right, I'll stop here. I'll pick up from this uh, in the next lecture.